Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this third in the program of MS A to Z. I'm Travis Gleason, and like many of you in our studio audience and many of you at home watching, I too live with multiple sclerosis, as Dr. Kraft said. Also like many of you, I faced my share of employment challenges with this disease. Now luckily, today is one of those good days, and I just need my cane today. Of course, <laughs> under all these studio lights, um, things may end up a little bit different by the end of the program. And for that reason, I hope that you don't mind, but um, I'm going to be taking a seat. A stool here while we chat for a moment, if that's all right. <clears throat> I may be a little limp by the end of the show, but um, that won't be for lack of an interesting topic, that's for sure. Here in the United States, we do derive much of our identities from our employment. Think about conversations at a cocktail party when you meet someone new socially for the first time. And what do you do is one of those first questions we seem to ask of one another. What if what we do, if it defines us so much and how much society thinks of us and how they view us, what if it's, it's no wonder then that when something like MS threatens our identity, our work identity, that we panic. Well, tonight, we're going to address many of the general questions of MS and employment. We'll talk about everything from how a diagnosis can change our perceptions of ourselves and of our abilities, to some real-world aids that can keep us in the employment game, even when MS makes it more difficult to play that game. Now. A vast team of professionals, all acting as a volunteer basis, have helped us put this program together, and we hope that you will find it beneficial. We've consulted with hundreds of people who face, are facing, or fear facing the challenges that we'll be discussing here tonight. But we all know it's not all about the fears. We'll also talk about successful avenues which can be navigated to make the most of our employment future, even with MS sticking its nose in our business. We'll be taking live questions from our studio audience, and we'll also invite you watching at home to join in the conversation by emailing us your questions as the program progresses. We've, we hope to answer as many of these questions during the program as possible. Now, it should go without saying, but let me say it here, and remember all of us that it would be neither prudent nor appropriate for our panel of guests to answer any medical or legal questions pertaining to a person's specific situation. For those, we'd suggest you speak to your own doctors and, when necessary, retain legal counsel. Now, that said, I think that we'll all learn a great deal about employment and MS tonight. If you'd like to submit a question for our panel, you can do so by emailing us here in the studio at msnorthwest at nm sswas.org. Again, and that address should be on the bottom of your screen now. It's nm, or I'm sorry, msnorthwest at nmsswas.org. And we'll get to as many of your questions as possible tonight, but we also know that we cannot get to everyone's. If you submit your email address along with your question, we'll have one of our professionals get back to you with an answer. How's that for a commitment? So, I keep saying that we'll try to get to everyone's questions, and here I am, you know, wasting time. So let's get to this show. Shall we get it rolling? <laughs> Our first guest lives on both sides of the MS employment equation. Ray Hecox was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 2003, though, like many of us, he experienced his first symptoms as much as 20 years before he heard the words that we all know so well. You have multiple sclerosis. At that time, when those first symptoms came up, Ray was working as an executive for NBC in New York. Nearly a decade on, Ray has held several interesting positions and has made his way back home to the Pacific Northwest, as he's originally from Tacoma. And he lives with his lovely and talented wife, Cynthia Huffman, where he is now the president and general manager of King 5 TV and the other BLO network stations here in the Northwest. And Ray is also the chairman of the board of trustees of the newly remonikered Greater Northwest chapter of the National MS Society, which offers programs, services, and assistance 
to over 10,000 people living with the diagnosis of MS and over 60,000 of their families, doctors, and employers. And I'm sure we'll be able to get to uh, coax Ray into talking a little bit about uh, some of those work uh, at the chapter. And so please help me welcome Ray Hecox. <laughs> Ray, welcome. Good to see you, Travis. It's good to be seen, actually. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you. Um, <laughs> so, um, 2003. Yep. What, what were you doing? And tell us a little bit about the whole diagnosis. Uh, the timing from a work point of view, since we're talking about a lot of this stuff having to do with career and everything else, is that I was the CEO of a, of a startup technology company. Um, I was living in New York and commuting to Atlanta every week. Um, so I actually cohabitated in both New York and Atlanta. Uh, and I had a pretty serious episode, um, which, uh, which made it almost impossible to walk until I got on uh, steroids for a little while and the episode abated so that I began to recover some of, uh, some of my mobility and was able to start to cope with things again. And how long did it sort of knock you out for that little bit? Um, actually, that, uh, that was the most significant single event. Um, and I would say that I had trouble walking for a good two to three weeks. Yeah. Um, before I started to recover some of my mobility. Okay. But that's not the first symptoms. No, tell, all right, so the first <laughs> symptoms, you're working in an NBC, and, yep. the, and that was a fairly long time between symptom and diagnosis. Yeah, actually, actually the first time that I had symptoms and any kind of diagnosis was in the mid-90s. Um, and what happened then was that I was working at NBC, I was in for my regular NBC physical, and I'd been having sort of these strange um, things with my foot dropping, tripping a little bit, um, I had some numbness in my legs and around my trunk, uh, and I told my doctor that, and he was wise enough right from the beginning to say, you need to go see a neurologist, and he sent me to a neurologist. Um, the problem is, is that I went through all the typical MS diagnosis stuff, um, MRIs starting from the head and working all the way down, and at the beginning they couldn't find any evidence of anything until they got to my lower spine. And so the first diagnosis wasn't multiple sclerosis because none of the really more typical multiple sclerosis diagnoses um, looked right. So it was diagnosed as transverse myelitis, which is right. a single occurring demyelination. Um, and, that's, and that's how it began. But the, the gap from 95 to 2003 was three was pretty much free of anything. So the, did any of that numbness, those little things continue? A, a, a little bit and the drop foot stayed. It never, it never really went away uh, along with the numbness and the feet and the toes. But mm -hmm. other, other things abated and then never really were significant. All right. And then we fast forward to, to diagnosis. And yep. you now you're, you're with a, a startup company um, uh, at a fairly high level, I'm guessing. Um, what, what changed? And we'll start with professionally. <laughs> what, what changed? Well, uh, um, <laughs> It, it, it's interesting to, you know, my, my case, I don't know if it's typical or, or not typical. I, I think you and I have talked many times about the fact that there is no such thing as typical <laughs> when you're talking. why don't we all want to be normal? <laughs> yeah, when you're talking about multiple sclerosis, but there's probably no typical in life either because everybody uh, has a whole bunch of different things going on. I was the CEO of a startup company that began in 2000. So anybody who's sort of conscious of the timing knows that that was at the end of the bubble, <laughs> uh, and it was a technology company. So the fact is there was a lot going on from a business point of view. Um, we were in our third round of financing, and the better part of Valor was that we sold the company to a larger company, and I was actually babysitting through the sale of the company and the transition to the new company uh, for that final year, and that's when, um, that's when it happened. So. It was in the midst of turning over the company and doing all kinds of crazy things. For me, though, because I'd gone through the thing in 95, and, and here I was in this, I, I sort of had this big episode, and that was freaky, but I didn't have that moment where I went, oh, my God, I have MS. Even after the diagnosis, I was sort of, something had been there all along, and it sort of just seemed like, thankfully, somebody finally identified what it is. You know, a lot of people, they, they say that, you know, uh, at least I know what it is now. Thankfully, I have a diagnosis. Yeah. So you, you sort of... Because you don't know. That, right. Through all that time. And then, professionally-wise, then you're, you're, you're selling this business, basically. You're going through that, yep. which is never a stressful thing, going through the due diligence <laughs> there. <laughs> it was very stressful. Yeah. So I decided that the, uh, the best thing to do is I had multiple sclerosis. I sold the business. I knew that I was going to retire from that, uh, from that activity that I was doing. 
uh, and I got an opportunity to start a graduate program in television management at Drexel University in Philadelphia. So I shortened my commute from New York to Atlanta to New York to Philadelphia. Same distance, train versus plane. <laughs> That's right, same time. Um, but it was supposed to be a very relaxed time, and I did some consulting, and I was teaching and doing that kind of stuff. Starting a graduate program, that's yeah. to be relaxing and, yeah. Yeah, well, it was, it was somewhat relaxing. <laughs> uh, but, but what you discover is there are different kinds of stress. And frankly, um, you know, the, the stress for me of being in that slower environment um, was just a different kind of stress. Right? It's so, a very slow environment in academia, isn't it? Well, it can be, but, but <laughs> learning, to, learning to cope with different things. You know, instead of coping with having 100 decisions to make a day, coping with spending lots and lots of hours doing research in order to be useful to students. Very different things. Quite different. Now, so you knew you had multiple sclerosis and you're changing jobs. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we'll talk more a lot of our questions that we've already gotten sent in have to do with disclosure. So at this point, um, for you personally, uh, telling the story, did, did you let the university know? Oh yeah. Um, actually, I think uh, lots of people who are professionals, and, and, and I need to state right up front, I'm just a person with multiple sclerosis in this conversation. I have absolutely no expertise. And there are a lot of experts who would say, don't do what he did, which is that from the day that I had my first diagnosis, I started blathering about it and talking about it, and it was no big deal to me. Um, and, and I really talked about it openly to everybody. And when I went to um, Drexel to interview, it was about 110 degrees in the room that I had to make my presentation to the faculty. So needless to say, I had to explain why I had to have a stool <laughs> in order to make that presentation. Yeah. Um, and, and it went very well. And then from then on, uh, you, when you went for another position, yep. it was already out there. Well, recruiter contacted me about the position here in Seattle, and uh, uh, when I started talking to the company, the first day I went, I was actually um, having very few symptoms at all, but I purposely carried my cane with me, uh, took it into rooms, made it comfortable for them to talk. Um, the company that I work for is spectacular. I don't recommend it for everybody. You know, you can't. You you have to know what your own um, situation is and how you want to pursue it because you take a certain amount of responsibility for that. In my case, um, I explained to him that the cane was for multiple sclerosis, and that was the last qu that was the last conversation that we had about it, and they hired me. So, it, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate in that yeah, respect. Very, very we'll, fortunate. We'll we'll get certainly into that uh, a lot later in yep. the program about how fortunate that, that is. And uh, you're not typical as far as employees go. I mean, you're certainly at the upper echelons of management, etc. Um, some would even say that you're a pillar of society, I've, I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> Only you, Travis, and you've been warned never to say that. But let's, um, <laughs> sorry, this will only live on the web forever, so there nobody will know. <laughs> He's getting even with me now. <laughs> but now, as an employer, how has MS affected the way that you manage people and how you run an organization? Well, you know, I... I or has it? Yeah, uh, yeah, I think it has in a, in, a, in a big way. I think the first the first thing is I'm lucky. I work for a company, Below Corp, that owns King Broadcasting. Uh, it is a very open company and very positive about the way that it deals with people. It's part of our. We have strong values, and it's part of the value system. Um, so that's the easy part. The second part of it is, you know, I can't hide it. I'm either on crutches or I'm in a scooter, and you'll get to see both of them tonight. But the fact of the matter is, um, people see it, and and my reaction. In the, in the environment is to make it go away. Everybody sees it the first time they see it, they're around me a few times, they understand about it, they get to ask about it, and then we just do our thing. Uh, and people understand that I have certain things that I do, you know, I, I joke all the time that we have a lot of meetings very close to uh, restrooms in the building because <laughs> one of the symptoms for MS is, and as, as anybody who's had it knows, is that you may have to be available to a restroom all the time. So that's you know, I think you might hear words like accommodation used, but part of what people are used to in working with me is that's, that's just part of life. I get up, I go, I come back, but it doesn't stop the work from happening. So um, I think that's good. The second part of it is four of my senior managers have chronic diseases. I have MS. We have somebody in the group who has diabetes, type 1 diabetes. We have somebody who has a uh, history of gout through many years, and we have another person who's had recurring cancer. So when you, when you stop and think about all the different kinds of things that go on in a workforce, you begin to realize that lots of people 
have chronic diseases in the workforce. You just don't know it most of the time. Right. And for a lot of people with MS, people don't see it. You know, one of the things that we always hear is, oh, you look so good. I know you and I don't hear that very often because we, you know, we don't. <laughs> um. <laughs> a different kind of looking good. <laughs> but... Um, uh, that's certainly one of the things that, that's out there is that people are wondering should they disclose, when they should disclose, and, and not, not speaking to the issue itself of when to disclose or what to say, but what, what would you say you know, as the employer, you know, what are some of the things that, that you would like your employees at least to think about and maybe some of the things that the, the viewers at home haven't uh, thought about, about disclosing? Yeah, the, uh, as I said, I'm not the expert. Um, I think I would hope that in the workforce that I'm in, just because I'm disclosed and people know that they feel somewhat more comfortable. But the absolute truth is there are, are in every business situation a whole lot of circumstances that people have to think about. And you bear responsibility for yourself to think them through and to analyze them. There are sometimes a lot of people in management positions between me and someone else who might be in the position of disclosing. And you know, I can't guarantee that 100% of them are going to behave exactly the same way that I might behave. So the truth is you have to take into consideration all the, all the facts that are in front of you in your own environment. My hope would be that since over 50% of the American population is likely to suffer from a chronic disease sometime in their working career, that people would find a way to be able to talk about it and that employers and employees would find the way to get the best possible work done. You know, employees, as an employee with a disease, I want to do my best. As an employer, I need employees to do their best. Somehow, when they're sick, we got to find a way for that to happen for both of us. Um, that's complicated. Um, it takes a lot of work, but um, it's the thing that's going to make people the most successful. And I talk to a lot of business groups, and the most important thing is from a, a business guy to other business people is, do everything you can to remember that the people who you are respectful of and support in the workplace are going to be the most loyal to you and to your company, and that that's a desirable thing. So, Is that part of the, the corporate culture that, that you have felt going into positions and that you try to foster then? Uh, that's, for me, I've been lucky and I've been in those positions. I absolutely have witnessed uh, environments that are not like that at all. Right. I, I could go back to earlier times in my career and places that I worked where I would, I would absolutely probably have not been instantly uh, willing to disclose because of the environment I was in. And what would one thing for employers who are watching, et cetera, um, what would be one thing that would, you would say to, to help create that culture? Um, discussion, openness. Um, you can't really put yourself in a position where you encourage people to do something they're not comfortable with doing. Um, you know, I, I don't want to give any of the sort of the legal advice you're going to hear from uh, from some fo folks later in this, I think, who are much more skilled than me. The, the thing is, we preach an open environment so that people have a chance to talk about it. And once you're comfortable, you should approach the right people, the people that you're comfortable with, that you've got a relationship with. Sometimes that's an HR department where, you're, where you have some security in talking to somebody who's not your direct boss, and they can advise you in those kind of situations. Lots of different choices, and I think as tonight goes on, we're going to hear a whole bunch of different situations, and some very negative ones. Right. There, that's some this, very this isn't, negative. We're ones. not wearing rose-colored colored glasses. Absolutely tonight. not. Um, when you do speak to employers that are out there, um, uh, what are you hearing that 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 they might want to know from the MS community? You know, what 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 should they know? What are they the questions they're asking you about how to be more open, et cetera? Well, I, I give you an example. I, I, I gave a talk about a year ago to a group of HR directors uh, on behalf of the MS Society. And in that conversation, there were a number of HR directors who had a lot of questions or were very responsive. But somebody came up to me after it was over and said, you know, the hardest thing that we have to face is I don't know how we can create an environment where I could approach somebody. Because as the employer you really are not in a position to approach somebody and say, gee, do you have? Or what's, you know, what's going on with that? And, and I think that genuinely there are plenty of companies that are looking for a way to handle it. They don't, they don't see it all the time. So much of it's hidden, so much of it's below the surface. Um, and if you talk to enough people in my position, 
I, I think they just are naive or don't know about it. Well, that's okay. We're sort of naive on this side of the, uh, the equation <laughs> as well sometimes. Exactly. So, um, you know, right now is not the best time out there on the employment uh, scape by any means. Uh, uh, People with disabilities who are looking maybe to get back in the employment scene uh, or trying to switch jobs after losing their jobs. What's what's your impression, just generally? And I know you can only speak to you know the Seattle Pacific Northwest area a little bit, or or possibly some, uh, in Texas as well, uh, where you do a, a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> where I have to travel. Exactly. So you've extended I'm in, your I'm commute in here. For that now they're going to not forgive me for that one. <laughs> Go ahead. But um, just so. What is, the, what is the landscape out there as you see it for people with disabilities who are looking to become employed or stay employed or change employment? Well, right now the, the prospects for everybody with 10% unemployment is, is not a pretty picture. You know, our, our economy went upside down. Uh, it's created a, a good deal of difficulty for lots of people, not just people with, um, with a chronic disease. Um, I, I think no matter what, you know what, I, I'll put it simply. I wake up in the morning, it takes me a half an hour of um, waking up before I'm even ready to have enough energy to go get ready to go to work in the morning. You know what? You start off with it's hard. So now you've got to go look for a job, you've got to interview, you've got to be in your best behavior, you have to analyze how to present, all that. Uh, it's hard. But you know what? You still got to go do it and you still got to get through that process. And um, I think that most people um, find that if they can find the right connection, the right place where they're working in an environment where they can do good work and be respected for it, that they're going to feel much better about everything in life, including their disease. So it's worth trying, but it's hard. It is hard. Um, and, and I think that everyone living with multiple sclerosis recognizes that, but we don't give ourselves enough credit some of the times. I, I know uh, for myself, uh, I beat myself up when I'm not doing as much as I used to do. Um, but uh, it, it is difficult, and, and I'm glad that you acknowledge that. I, I certainly uh, appreciate that. Now, because you do some traveling, we've got just a, a little bit of time here. Um, traveling in an airport for business and business travel and things, how do you find um, that? Um, well, thanks to my wife, the actual travel part of it's not so bad anymore, but I still hate it because it takes a lot of energy in order to do it. It's stressful. Travel travel is just one of those things that for every week I travel, I'm pretty sure that I'm giving up an extra week of life. That's how I look at travel. <laughs> um, however, I used to go to the airport and I used to take my crutches or my cane and I'd try to walk through the line and I'd go through the thing and I'd get... Now, I arrive at the airport sit in a wheelchair, guy drives me through the line, I'm the first one through the security line, I'm at the gate, and I'm done. And you know what? The day that I accepted that and was able to do that was the day I could go back and travel again. So it's, it's a tough decision to make. It's a tough call to say that I need that, but it's like any, any accommodation you need at work. When you say you need it, it helps you do your job. Makes it possible for me to do it. All right. Well, thank you, Ray. We're going to uh, let Ray take a break from these hot lights for a little bit. And thank you very much, Mr. Hecox. Thank you. Always good to see you. Um, but he'll be back later in the program, and he's going to join our panel for a group discussion for your questions. And again, we thank Ray, and we'll see him back here in just a little bit. <laughs> our next guest is Dr. Kurt Johnson. And Dr. Johnson is a professor in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine here at the University of Washington. He received his PhD in Rehabilitation Psychology from the University of Wisconsin at Madison and taught at Florida State University before coming to the UW in 1990. He teaches in both the Disability Studies Program and the Doctoral Program in Rehabilitation Sciences. Dr. Johnson is also an active researcher in the areas of employment, technology, and disabilities. He's particularly interested with respect to his research in people living with multiple sclerosis. Dr. Johnson is the co-director of the Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on MS at the University of Washington. Try saying that three times fast. Please help me welcome Dr. Kurt Johnson. Kurt, good to see you. So, Thank you for commuting a long ways from your office down here to the studios at the <laughs> University of Washington. Um, 
we we talked a little bit with Ray uh, about the employment scene out there, um, and he was was very stark in saying, well, you know, 10% unemployment, it's not good for anyone. Um, but how do you see, in general, the situation of employment as far as people living with multiple sclerosis in the U.S.? It's kind of hard to figure out exactly what the employment situation is for people living with MS because MS is predominantly a, a disease that affects women, often first diagnosed in their <clears throat> 20s at the, about the time that they would be often starting a family. And so it's hard to tell how much of the employment picture is related to the age at which people first are uh, diagnosed, uh, how much of it has to do with MS. But historically, if we look, I have a couple of slides here. Historically, about 70 to 80% of people with MS were unemployed five years after diagnosis. And that's, wow. Yeah, that's in a group of folks who are really, you know, generally well-educated and we'd expect to be working at a higher rate. Now, most recently, that was what we found 10 years ago. Most recently, it's gone down to 60%. We think that's probably because of the, or maybe because of the immunomodulatory drugs, the impact of the new drugs, mean people are able to stay in the game longer. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, suppose that that might have anything to do with better diagnostic techniques, diagnosing people earlier? Uh, the National MS Society has done a lot of things as far as educating primary care physicians to recognize first symptoms of MS. Do you think that that might be part of it as well, that, that diagnosis is happening three, four, five years earlier now? Well, I would defer that to Dr. Kraft, but yeah, I, I think probably so, and that people actually start the ABC meds earlier when they have a better chance of changing the trajectory of mm -hmm. the um, development of symptoms. So yeah, all of those things. Very good. But most people have worked at one time or another in their lives. And we'll talk more about this later, but one of the things that I don't think comes as a surprise to people living with MS is that about 30% of the people who are employed have measurable changes in their cognitive status, where 70% of the people who are unemployed do it. So we think that for many people, it may be the cognitive changes that actually are the at least a significant reason that they end up leaving the market. Forty percent, almost half of the people who are unemployed would rather work, and I think that fits with what Ray was just saying, mm -hmm. is that employment's a valued activity and it's important. And I guess it's no surprise that in our work we found that people who are employed consistently say that they have a higher quality of life. Mm -hmm. They're better off. And you know, I, I was when Dr. Kraft was doing the introduction. I hadn't really thought about the the fact that it's um, as a clinician when I go to see my doctor or, or my nurse practitioner, we do talk about work that's going on. We talk about the things that are happening outside, and I had never thought about that. That's a way that they're actually gauging my progress or digress, whatever, with the, with this disease. So um, that does make a lot of sense. And now we also alluded at the very beginning of the program of the fact that. Um, uh, in America in particular, uh, we derive so much of ourselves, our identity from, from our jobs. And um, a, a person works for so many reasons other than just to get a paycheck. So um, talking about that quality of life issue, how, how do you see staying employed um, or seeking employment affecting the, the, um, the quality of life for a person living with this disease? Well, I don't want to understand, understate the value of a paycheck. I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> one, one of the reasons that we hear from people that the main reasons they work is is because they need the money, right? And, and, I and think, the benefits, obviously. and the benefits. And I think uh, and just mentioned that that game may have changed with the passage of healthcare reform. But right. previously, people often were caught in this trap where they either had to work in order to get benefits, or they had to be unemployed in order to get Medicare. And there's some tricks around mitigating that, but it is a pretty stark contrast. So we may see that people have more flexibility, and I hope that has some impact on the employment picture. But aside from that, and aside from the kind of the importance to people's self-image, and we hear from people it's really important they, for them to feel like they contribute to the family, mm -hmm. that, that they bring in some money, um, that uh, it's important to their kind of social identity, as, as you mentioned earlier on. But we also heard that, uh, I've heard people say that, you know, it doesn't hurt as bad when I'm at work. My pain isn't as bad. When I lie at home in bed during an exacerbation, my pain is really unbearable. When I'm at work, I can ignore it. I've heard people say that 
it's a lot that the structure of work is important. It's a lot easier for me to get up in the morning when I have something I know I'm going to be doing. Right. Now that said, most people with MS, the majority, don't work, and I think many people um, have a very creative ways to have a high quality of life and to do things that are important to them. But work has kind of a unique place in, in life. Right, and one of the things that I've been reading a lot lately when you were talking about cognitive issues uh, with people with MS is that a lot of that can actually, and fatigue as well, be derived from levels of depression. And so uh, I'm wondering, thinking back to your, uh, your first slide there, if maybe some of the antidepressant drugs <coughs> are helping people's cognition and maybe they're able to stay employed a little bit longer. In your research, are you f seeing that depression uh, from MS uh, or MS-related depression is, is affecting employment at all? It's not clear. And we just actually published a study on what contributes to employment. And, I think we probably are hindered by not being able to do a fine enough grained analysis. But the truth is, is that, that depression and fatigue and cognitive changes and pain all coexist. And it's hard to tease them apart. Dr. Edie will talk in much more detail about this in, I believe, the next episode when she talks about depression and MS. Okay. Very good. So, so it's a tough time to be searching for employment or trying to stay employed for anyone. And then we throw MS into the, the whole mix there. What are some of the, the specific challenges about getting employed, staying employed with MS in the picture? Yeah, well, let's look at the barriers. I mentioned that one of the big barriers is a systemic one, which has to do with the way that our benefit system works. Right. And that's, that's a barrier. But some of the things that people just live with include uh, the physical changes that may have to do with changes in mobility and changes in vision and fatigue and pain, um, the cognitive changes we mentioned, the environmental differences. Uh, Ray mentioned going to the airport. You know, it, environments can be more or less accessible and it can be hot and they can be cold. There's social variables like um, I had one woman who told me that, that people at work often thought maybe she'd been drinking or something because she'd slur her speech a little bit or she'd be leaning against the walls for support. And she'd say, it's just 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I haven't had my first drink yet. You know? <laughs> um, and then there's the psychosocial issues around, around depression and anxiety and, and evaluation of your own self-worth. And I think these all end up in an economy of resources that people have. And you have things that contribute to that and take away from it. And if I have to think, okay, foot, where are you going next? If I have to spend cognitive energy thinking about that, that takes away some of the energy I might have to spend on work. And the same thing is true if I have to be vigilant about what I say to make sure I don't say things I don't mean to. And, and so when we talk about accommodations in a minute, we'll talk about how we can mitigate some of that. Right. And there are so many different symptoms to multiple sclerosis, and then so many of those symptoms can affect so many different aspects of a job and obviously uh, our economy goes everything from manufacturing and delivery to service uh, so I mean it's it can affect everyone differently and it can affect all of us in our jobs differently um, so so what can people do who are experiencing symptoms to, to stay in their jobs as their MS progresses yeah well I think the first bit of advice is don't quit well that would what? help staying employed <laughs> yes <laughs> Uh, one of the things that we see is that when people have an exacerbation, often I, everybody's scared uh, uh, at times when you have a significant exacerbation, and often uh, people may think, I just got to get out of work. It's too stressful. Right. And so our advice is don't do that. <laughs> Sit tight, stay the course, wait till things calm down when you can make an informed decision and really think through what the future is. Right. And that leads to the second point. And the second point is that it's important to be strategic and think over the long term about what kinds of accommodations you're going to need, what kind of resources you have, and, and, and realistically about what the changes may be in your, in your MS as you go. And, and you, you talked about accommodations and, and you teased it very well yourself there. So, so what are some of the typical accommodations that, that people need to ask for, maybe are afraid to ask for, but once they do, I, I always use the, uh, the analogy of uh, most of us wait about 30% too long to use an assistive device. You know, we, we struggle wall walking and furniture walking and not taking a walk down the block 
uh, and then eventually we'll use a cane and we can we realize we can walk three blocks with a cane and you know we just we have that barrier in our in our heads um, but what kind of accommodations seem to work in the workplace yeah well, there are a couple of groups of accommodations. One, and the accommodations can either be informal, you just do them, and everybody right. agrees on them by, cons you know, it just happens. Or you just or make they, them yourself. You make them yourself, right? Or they can be formal. And Andrea will talk a little bit more, more about the, the mechanisms for formal ones. But one kind is about the process or kind of the conditions of employment. So that uh, one woman that we, I know um, had a lot of difficulty. She got fatigue concentrating and she had a job that required a lot of concentration so she'd come in at 4:30 or 5 in the morning and do the tough stuff before people came in and distracted her and before she got fatigued and then she'd do the routine kinds of things later on in the day and go home early um, another example is it's that people may need to nap or break up the activities of the day and kind of recharge their batteries. And mm -hmm. so they may do that with, uh, by taking a power nap or relaxation or any number of kinds of strategies. But the idea is, is to take the top off that fatigue by intervening or resting or relaxing before you get so tired that you've lost it. Right. So you kind don't of get to that lay down or fall down state. Exactly. The other group of things have to do with um, uh, kind of organizational strategies and, and uh, 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 that desk is significantly cleaner than mine at home. My desk is a disaster. <laughs> and this is someone who was having more and more trouble um, concentrating and, and getting her work done. She did took orders and worked on the phone. And with one of my colleagues, she was able to do a makeover on her office and reorganized everything. And you can see kind of from that picture how the flow of work moves from where the orders come in and the phone all the way over to where her fax and printer are. And it was just uncluttering that environment and organizing the stream of work was enough to make her much more efficient and reduce her fatigue. So that's kind of a simple uh, kind of solution. And would this be something that, that a, a person who was, uh, was seeking some accommodations, that, that they would say to their employer, okay, I'm having this problem. And is it best probably to go to the employer with the solution as well as the problem? If possible? If you know the solution, yeah. the employ most employers won't know how to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And so usually you have to be the expert. And, and I'll talk in a minute about some resources that you can get. But, and I think often the chapter, the NS chapter can help with that. Right. But, Go ahead. But then there's another group of things that are just, I'll just, there's a zillion ways to do this. But I'll just throw a few examples out. Is that a real number, a zillion? A zillion, absolutely. Okay. One of the best accommodations is your appointment book, your memory book, your day timer mm -hmm. that you can put things in. And that works fabulously well. And then we have electronic versions of those. And the idea is, is can you automate some features of memory and organization so that you reduce the demands on your brain? And that's the biggest part of fatigue is, is too much brain activity right. going on to move your foot, like you said. That, that's part of what causes right. fatigue. Right. And, if the people aren't, if we're not experts in what we need, where, where can we go to, to find help with these employment issues? I, I know here at the university, you're at a facility that obviously offers that, but where else? Well, I think people should start with their chapter of the MS Society. Um, where they have navigators. Yes, the MS Navigators, are, and we'll talk about a little bit about that in a moment. Yeah, so. and the, because it's, it, where to go for help depends on what resources you have. Do you have health insurance? Are you working? Are you not working? and they can help talk through. But the examples of the places are certainly, we provide that through the University of Washington Medical uh, Center through our, our neural rehabilitation program and our rehabilitation counseling service and our assistive technology service, as does Dr. Frazier, who's a colleague of ours in our department. But there's also the State Department of Vocational Rehabilitation where people can get assistance with even keeping a job or getting a new job, and there's one of those in each state. All right, and, and the name of that organization again? It's, in our uh, state, it's the Division of Vocational Re Rehabilitation. All right, so it's something along that line in the yeah. Department of Labor, probably. All right, well, we just have a, a, a few seconds left, and um, so I want to ask you, if a person knows that they need certain levels of accommodation and might not necessarily want to disclose that they have MS going into a new uh, job interview, et cetera, what, what might be a couple of strategies to, to kind of introduce those, those ideas? Well, we'll let Andre talk about this disclosure piece, right. but um, some people find that they can be fairly generic about 
it's often easier to disclose that you have fatigue than you have cognitive changes, for example. And many of the accommodations that you would use for fatigue will also accommodate cognitive changes. And so uh, one of the things that people can do is say, you know, I've, I, I have a lot of trouble with fatigue. I can certainly do this job, but if I can break this up a little bit into chunks, I'll be more successful. But I think people usually do better if they can do that on their own, if they can just... Just do it without disclosing it, so to or speak. Or informally. Yeah. yeah, very good. All right, Dr. Johnson, you'll be back uh, to join us in our group discussion and for our questions, so I thank you very much. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, Dr. Kurt Johnson. So I don't know about you, but I've already learned like bushels here tonight um, about employment. And uh, we've already heard uh, several useful tips, some inspiring stories of successes, and, and some of the pitfalls that we want to uh, avoid. Uh, this is really valuable information, and I can see um, that we're already getting some email questions uh, via the email address, which is uh, on your screen. And we encourage you to keep sending in those email questions uh, to the address that's there, the graphic. Our next guest is Andrea Brennecke. Ms. Brennecke is the University of Washington alum and was a cum laude graduate of Harvard Law School. It's too bad you couldn't get into good schools, right? Uh, she practices law in the Seattle firm of McDonald, Hogue, and Bayless, where she specializes in employment law and civil rights litigation, as well as facilitation of some creative solutions in several workplace issues. So please help me welcome attorney Andrea Brennecke. Thank you very much for being here and for putting up with, you know, the first part of the program. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, we've, we've teased it a little bit earlier, the, the ADA, the Americans with, the, with Disabilities Act. And I'm wondering, what does that mean as far as employment is concerned? Okay. The Americans with Disabilities Act is a fabulous civil rights act that provides employees with two basic rights. The first is the right to be free from discrimination because of disability. And that includes everything from hiring to firing, promotions, layoffs. You're not to be treated differently because of a disability in those areas. It also prevents uh, harassment or hostile work environment because of disability, which occurs. The other broad area that the ADA covers is the right to a reasonable accommodation of a disability. And we were talking right. about that earlier in the program. But the ADA protects employees and gives them the right to come forth and say, I have a disability, and in order to perform the essential functions of my job, I need a reasonable accommodation. And for the employer then to have to provide that. The employers, however, aren't psychic. So that's where disclosure comes in. We'll, we'll talk certainly about that. Um, does the ADA cover all disabled employees? No. The ADA, um, first of all, there's a threshold limit, which is that it only covers employers that have 15 or more employees. Okay? So it's larger employers. So the smaller employees are, employers are excluded. That said, there are often state or local laws that cover um, smaller employers. For instance, the Washington Law Against Discrimination covers employers with eight or more employees. Okay? Oh, all right. The second issue is that an employee to be covered has to be able to perform the essential functions of their job with or without accommodations. Okay? And that's something we can get into later. Then there's a question of how is disability defined? Not everything that comes up would necessarily be covered as a disability under the law. Um, so there are three general aspects to the definition. Mm -hmm. okay? The first is, and, and the, I have a slide that addresses this, whether the employee has a physical or mental condition that substantially limits one or more major life activities. And okay? what, would, what would be considered a life activity? Okay. So major life activities that have been recognized in the law include walking, seeing, hearing, lifting, bending, concentrating, thinking, okay? Right. So um, MS fits that. Yes, and, and the law has expanded also to acknowledge um, major bodily functions and, and systems. So brain function or the neurological function or um, an endocrine um, system or the digestive system. To the extent there's an impairment in those areas, um, that would also be considered uh, uh, 
disability. So for the most part, anyone who's been diagnosed with MS, I would say, has a very high likelihood, if not a guarantee, that they would be covered under the law. Um, there's also, though, uh, a way of qualifying for the ADA application, which is that an employee has a history of a disability. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you've had an episode and weren't maybe diagnosed and then um, you know, years later something occurs, that prior incident, if you have a medical record of having a period of disability, that could help you qualify for the ADA protections. Mm -hmm. And finally, the ADA covers people who are perceived to have a disability, even though they don't. So what we're also trying to acknowledge, I guess, in the law here is that if an employer thinks that someone has a disability and they don't, that they still can't discriminate against them because of that perception. I see. All right. That's, um, that's pretty broad. Mm -hmm. And you st said here in the state of Washington, the, 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 the rules are a little bit more stringent. Are most states, because this is going out uh, nationally and then internationally over the web, are most states um, at least as stringent as the ADA? I wouldn't say our state law is more stringent. In fact, historically, our state law has been uh, bro has had a broader definition of disability and the ways in which it applies. What I can say is that with recent changes, both to our state law and our, our federal law, um, what the exact tests are and how they apply do differ. And it's in these areas where it's very helpful to have an employment lawyer look at this. I would say, in general, states and local laws cover um, similar aspects of disability, both the right to be free from discrimination because of disability and the right to a reasonable accommodation. Well, and now speaking of accommodations, and, and uh, we were talking with Dr. Johnson about that, mm -hmm. uh, the, the timing of, uh, of disclosing uh, has a lot to do with uh, when a person has a certain need for accommodation, etc. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just say it flatly, when should a person disclose that they have MS and to whom? Yeah. Uh, that's a question that I think does depend upon the circumstances that the person finds themselves that's in. That's such a lawyer's answer. I know it's a lawyer's <laughs> answer, but, the, but how can one answer that? My general sense is we have a law against discrimination because discrimination exists in the employment arena and other arenas. Okay, it's not it's not uh, rocket science to know, to, to say that yes, people are discriminated against because of their disability. So a lot of people legitimately don't come out and disclose a disability because they are either fearful that they're going to be treated differently or that they have a reasonable expectation they will based upon what they've what seen they've their seen employer before, do. Sure. Okay? And I have a full-time job doing this kind of work because unfortunately people are treated differently because of their disabilities and it's not something to take lightly. That said, you also don't have the right to an accommodation unless you disclose that you have some sort of disability and you need that accommodation. So it's a bit of a catch-22. Mm -hmm. And my advice to my clients is usually that you want to disclose at the point that you feel like you need an employer-based accommodation and before performance issues come up. Because if you're noticing that along the way your performance is slipping or you're unable to do something the way you did and you think that this is going to become an issue in your ability to stay employed, it's better to own where you are and to figure out creative solutions and to work with your employer as a partner to say, hey, you know what, I'm noticing that in this area I need an accommodation and to do that affirmatively and powerfully. Yeah, that's not that easy. <laughs> well, it is and it's not. I think um, it's not easy, but I think in many situations, employers will take the cue from the employee. Mm -hmm. And we've seen modeled up here both by you and by Ray, very powerful people with disabilities. And if somebody is working in a work environment and they're a valued member of that work environment, just because they have a new diagnosis doesn't mean they're any less valued. And if they go into a situation and say, you know, this is the situation, I have a doctor's support for this, I've thought about how I can still remain the most productive employee I can, and they come to the table with a problem-solving mind, I've found that generally they feel more powerful in the process and that the success rate goes up. All right. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. So then, then when going in to seek a workplace accommodation, legally, what's required then of, of the, uh, the person living with MS? Well, the first thing I 
encourage my clients to do is to make sure they're working in conjunction with their health team. Okay? Because a reasonable accommodation, there's a slide on this just to remind folks, is a reasonable accommodation is any change in the work environment or in the way that things are normally done that helps a person with a disability perform the essential functions of their job. So sometimes it's physical, mm -hmm. increasing the accessibility of a work environment, allowing a wheelchair or a scooter, changing the dynamics of the desk. Sometimes uh, because of fatigue or um, the need to rest, as you were saying, it might be a modification of work schedules, an opportunity to take breaks or work from home, sometimes a change of assignments. Um, sometimes, if a person has an exacerbation, they need a leave of absence for, from work altogether for a certain period of time. And finally, if accommodations don't seem to be working in that, you might need a transfer to another job. So depending on what the person's dealing with, um, having a medical professional working with them, knowing what their limitations are, knowing what their abilities are, brainstorming with them and providing the, legal, the medical context for what they're asking for, you can have a written uh, request for an accommodation that can go to an employer that will have some solutions built in with some, some suggestions for the accommodation. In terms of the process, um, I think there are really three points to think about when you're dealing with your right to a reasonable accommodation mm -hmm. of a disability. And there's a slide on this one too. First of all, the employer doesn't have to provide an accommodation if doing so would cause an undue hardship for the employer. Um, that's looking at things from a very general perspective. Who is the employer? How big are they? What are the financial and other functional um, requirements that the, the accommodation would require? It's a very fact-specific situation. And in most cases, um, I would say the undue hardship is one one could argue about later, but let's not worry about that now because most of these accommodations are really quite simple and don't cost that much. Okay, So in order to trigger, trigger the right to an accommodation, the employee has to provide notice of the disability and the need for the accommodation. And so usually this is where the medical piece comes in. You provide the, the nexus, if you will, between what the disability or the limitations are and what the job functions are and therefore say in this case I'm having trouble doing this particular aspect of my job because of my physical limitations. My accommodation for that I would suggest would be the opportunity to do that work from a different location, do that work from home, be able to use my scooter. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, once the employee though, the employee doesn't have to have the whole list of solutions. It's helpful I think to have some. What they really need to do is provide that notice and request the accommodation. What that does is it triggers a duty on behalf of the employer to engage in an interactive process with the employee. And often what that looks like is a request for information from medical providers. Often it provokes or, or, or it prompts a very formal job description, for instance, that has mm -hmm. all the essential functions of the job and a request for information as to what is the diagnosis? What is the prognosis? Which of these you know, essential functions of the job do you need accommodations of and, and what do you recommend? The law presumes this interaction between the employee and the employee's medical providers and the employer. And in the end, reasonable accommodations are those that can help the employee do those essential functions of the job. All right. Well, that, that makes sense. It sounds a lot easier than it is, I'm sure. So, so what happens if a person just can't do the required tasks of that job anymore? Is the employer required to offer them another position within the company or what, what happens then? So once an employer and an employee have exhausted accommodations of the same job, this is like, okay, look, it's not going to work. Then the employee is entitled to a position, if it is open in the employer's um, business, that is comparable job or less for which they qualify. Um, and it is a right to, to move. You, you should get the presumption that you get that job if it's open. Mm -hmm. The employer doesn't have to bump someone else and there's certain seniority rules and such that they don't have to violate. But generally speaking, if there's an open job and the employee qualifies it, qualifies for it, that transfer would be an appropriate accommodation as well. All right. And, and I hate to use the term if everything falls apart, but just as sort of our, our last question here, if everything does fall apart, mm -hmm. um, what are we supposed to do if we're experiencing discrimination in, in the workplace um, or if uh, the employer won't make the accommodation? What do we do then? Okay. And that happens. I have seen employers who have actually terminated people shortly after they asked for accommodation. I've 
and I've seen things fall apart. And it's, it's a, a horrible thing to live through. And my recommendation is you see an employment lawyer. You come to see someone like me and look at, um, bring forth all of the circumstances that happen and we can analyze. Is this something that can be remedied through a lawsuit uh, or at least through notice to the employer that, hey, you know, disability laws apply here. What happened wasn't appropriate. Please fix this thing or else litigation may ensue. So that's the other piece of my job. <laughs> and, and what does that, that look like now? I mean, how are those cases faring? Um, we've had quite a bit of success, actually, in that area. In fact, my office just um, tried a case against a local employer uh, for a failure to accommodate a disability. And um, we're successful, and it was a almost $600,000 um, award for the employee for the losses he suffered, both in terms of his wage loss, his emotional distress, um, his exacerbation of his disability, mm. and then there are other damages. Those stresses that, definitely can make the yeah. illness seem worse. So, I, and I don't, I don't think jurors have a lot of tolerance for employers who really refuse to engage in the accommodations process. What can get tricky is what is reasonable, who did what, if the interactive process broke down, is it the employee's fault because they got frustrated and walked away, or is it the employer's fault because they weren't being reasonable and they didn't come up with ideas? There are lots of disputes. It's not easy, but it's certainly worth enforcing your rights because that's the only way these laws have any value or any meaning. All right. Well, thank you very much. That's thank informative, and, and we're definitely going to have a lot of questions for you okay. uh, as the program goes on. Well, thus far in the program, we've heard from Ray Hecox about his experiences with being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and his successes as an employee with MS and some of the issues he now faces as an employer with MS. We've gotten some of the nuts and bolts information from Dr. Kurt Johnson about continuing to work even when MS requires some changes in the way we do our jobs or even if it changes the jobs that we can do. And finally, from Andrea Brennecke, a peek into the legal rights that we all have, as well as our responsibilities as people living with MS and trying to stay employed in our jobs, or if we're looking for a new one. And we're just getting started. <laughs>